So welcome everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, welcome our first speaker, Joel Dong uh, from Uppsala University. He's gonna tell us about computations of tight eigenvalue enclosure enclosures for Laplacian eigenvalues. Yes, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And to begin with, I also want to thank the organizers for, for this opportunity uh, to, to give a talk here at, uh, at this event for graduate students. Uh, so yes, I will talk about uh, some recent work about computing tight enclosures for, for eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Uh, so I want to mention that this is joint work with Bruno Salvi at the UNS Lyon. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, that since this talk is only 15 minutes long, I will have to cut a lot of the details. Uh, so if you want more details, you can ask later or you can and look in the, in the paper, which has the same title and was recently published in the Science Journal of Scientific Computing. Uh, yes. So, as the title says, I will talk about computing eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Uh, however, the motivation for doing this comes from a different area of mathematics, which is discrete walks. Uh, so this area of discrete walks is an active field of research. Uh, and one of the important goals in it is to understand the asymptotic behavior of discrete walks on, on lattices. So in this case, uh, the lattice is, is n to the d. And in the cases I will talk about, d will be equal to 3. Uh, so, the number of walks of length n, which starts and ends at the origin in this lattice, uh, asymptotically behave, behaves like this. So there's some constant, which is not too important. It's uh, the rho, uh, which is easy to compute if you just know which discrete walk you're working with. Uh, and then it's this alpha value, which is more complicated. So alpha can be computed in this way. Uh, so it's given by this formula where lambda one is the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the spherical triangle. So exactly which spherical triangle this depends on the on the on the precise walk, uh, but the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on on some spherical triangle. Uh, and one important question about this alpha is if it's rational or not. So depending on if it's rational or irrational has important implications when you when you look at the combinatorics and the, about this. Uh, so this is the motivation, but what I actually talk about is how to compute rigorous enclosures of eigenvalues of the Laplacian on spherical triangles. So I will not discuss any of this part. Uh, I will come back slightly to this alpha towards the end, uh, but otherwise my focus will be on computing these rigorous enclosures of, uh, of the eigenvalues. So we want to compute an enclosure. Uh, what we need then is to some way to, given an approximation, compute, uh, compute sort of error bounds to get our enclosure. And the main tool uh, we will use is this theorem by Foxy and Rich and Moller from 1967. Uh, so what it says is that given lambda and this u lambda, which is an eigenvalue and an, uh, which is an approximate eigenvalue and eigenfunction, and approximate in this case means that they, they do satisfy the differential equation inside of the uh, domain D but they do not necessarily satisfy the boundary condition. So they are not true eigenvalues and eigenfunctions because it's, it's not identity equal to zero on the boundary. So it's, it's called an approximate eigenfunction. Uh, but this, given this approximate pair, uh, we can define epsilon to be this the square root of the area of the domain times the maximum of the, of the approximate eigenfunction on the boundary divided by the norm of this uh, approximate eigenfunction. Uh, the theorem then tells us that uh, given this epsilon, there exists a true eigenvalue, lambda star, which is, uh, satisfies this, meaning that uh, lambda star is close to lambda if epsilon is small. So this gives us a way to, given an approximate eigenfunction, compute this epsilon, or at least upper bound it, and then we get uh, sort of explicit bounds um, how close we are to a true eigenfunction a true eigenvalue. Uh, so we want to find this lambda and u lambda. And what we want to do is, is with this is we want to make this epsilon small. So in particular, we want to make it small on the boundary. This is sort of the part that we can, com uh, can, uh, can work with. So how do we do this? Well, the tool here will be, uh, we'll use a method called the method of particular solutions. Uh, so this was introduced by Fox and Rich and Moller in the same paper but it has later been improved uh, by Betkin Treveden 
in their paper, reviving the method of particular solutions. Uh, so it's a method for finding such lambda and u lambda. Uh, the idea of the method is that you start with some set of uh, functions, which do satisfy the differential equation, but you require nothing about the boundary values. And then you make your function a linear combination of these. Uh, so it will also satisfy the, the differential equation, but you try to choose the coefficients in such a way so that it's as small as possible on the boundary. Uh, so the, the important part is that we want to, to choose these coefficients to make this u lambda small on the boundary. So there's a lot more details to discuss about this, uh, but I will not talk more about that now. Uh, I should just mention two things. The first is that this choice of uh, functions here is rather important. So uh, to get good convergence, we need to have a good set of functions that we that we, in our basis somehow. Uh, and in our case, it will be two different cases. One of them I will refer to as the easy case and one as the hard case. Uh, but I will not discuss too much more about it. But you will see it later on. Uh, another thing I should mention is that at this point, we don't need to do anything rigorously. Uh, it's uh, any numerical approximation is fine. We just need it to, to be sort of good. Uh, but we don't need any error bounds or anything. Uh, what I will discuss more about is how to compute this enclosure. So given lambda and u lambda, we want to upper bound this epsilon. This is what gave us the, the ball that contained uh, the true eigenvalue. Uh, it consists of three parts. The first one is just the square root of the area. And this is easy to handle. There's not much to discuss. Uh, the, first, the second part is the, the norm of this eigenfunction, or this approximate eigenfunction. And in this case, we need a lower bound of it since it occurs in the denominator. Uh, and it's also this, the supremum on the boundary, so the, the maximum on the boundary. Uh, and here we want an upper bound uh, in this case. If we start with the norm, uh, we will lower bound the norm by computing in a part of the domain. And here we have two different cases, but depending on which set of eigenfunctions uh, or sort of uh, in which set of um, functions we start with in this method of particular solutions. Uh, in one of the cases, the easy case, uh, this norm reduces to a sum of 1D integrals if we consider it on a specific part of the domain. Uh, more specifically, if we consider it of this sort of, at least in spherical coordinates, rectangular part of the domain, then on this this domain, on this part of the domain, this norm reduces to the sum of 1D integrals. And then it's, rather easy, then it's very easy to compute. You just use any sort of verified integrator and we get a, a, a good enclosure, a, a good lower bound of the norm in a very short time. Uh, the harder case, uh, we have to work a bit more. Uh, so we, it doesn't reduce to some sum of 1D integrals in this case. Uh, but instead, we follow uh, some recent work by Gomez Serrano and uh, Oriols. Uh, and uh, what we do then is that we partition the domain into smaller pieces. And on each part, we use a version of the minimum principle uh, and together with uh, the faber kron inequality to get a lower bound for the eigenfunction in each part. So we manage to lower bound the eigenfunction in each of these parts in the partitioning. And from this, we can then uh, trivially get a lower bound for the for the norm. Uh, this is uh, much more costly to do numerically. So, so this part is very cheap, whereas in this harder case, we have to work a lot harder for this. Uh, okay, and then it's the upper bound of the maximum. Uh, there are two complications here. One is that there's a lot of oscillations, so the uh, eigenfunction will naturally uh, sort of oscillate on the boundary, uh, which makes it uh, harder to, to work with. But the more important problem is that we have extreme cancellations. So we have uh, a sum of functions where the individual functions are not small, but where the sum, uh, the, the coefficients in the sum is chosen in such a way so that they cancel out on the boundary as much as possible. Uh, this means that any sort of naive interval uh, enclosure of this will be terrible because uh, all of this cancellation will will not work very well in interval arithmetic. Uh, the solution to this is to that we used is to use Taylor expansions of, of high degree uh, to give this tighter enclosures. Uh, so we can compute uh, Taylor expansion as the midpoint of an interval to high precision, uh, 
uh, and then we don't suffer too much from these cancellations. Uh, and I mean, the enclosure will be suffer from the cancellations, but as long as the degree is sufficiently high, we will we will be fine. Uh, so in this case, for example, I think it was computed using uh, Taylor expansion of degree 16 uh, to get these enclosures. Uh, this is rather costly, mostly because we have to work with Taylor expansions of very high degree. Uh, okay, so what do we get from this? Uh, what, what what sort of results do we get when we want to try to compute these enclosures? So here is two cases, the, the sort of easy case which I mentioned and the harder case. Uh, indeed, if we look at the easy case to begin with, uh, the x-axis here is the number of terms in uh, in the sum that gives us the approximate eigenfunction. Uh, the blue line here in the bottom is the approximate error we get. Uh, so this is just using method of particular solution and looking at the approximate error. Uh, and we see that it goes down quite quickly. But it sort of has some nice behavior. Uh, the line above is when we compute the rigorous depth alone bounded. And then we see that uh, then we get, uh, get this bound for error. Uh, so this is a rigorous bound. And this is, in this case, it's quite nice because we see that they both sort of converge quite nicely and at a similar pace. We lose a bit when we go to the rigorous error, but, but not too much. And it only increases slightly as we go uh, get more digits. Uh, also, it's a very straight uh, line, which is, uh, it looks nice at least. The harder case is, is similar in principle, but the convergence is a bit worse. Uh, you see here we have 10 to the minus 25 compared to, to minus 10. Uh, we also lose a bit more when we consider the rigorous error. Uh, compared to the, yes, the approximate error. Uh, and there's a lot more fluctuations, so it's a bit more uh, unstable, some of the, the approximation. Uh, so one particular case that we were interested in is the so-called crevras walk. So this is a particular discrete walk, which in two dimensions is very well understood. Uh, and in this case, the corresponding alpha is, is rational. I think it's equal to minus five over two. Uh, whereas in 3D, it's not uh, as well understood. And in particular, uh, it's not known if alpha is rational or irrational in this case. So we wanted to, to take a look at it and, and sort of get an idea of what's happening. So this corresponds to a spherical triangle with all angles equal to two pi over three. So we compute uh, the eigenvalue, which gives us this, uh, this value. So the, all of these digits are, are, are correct somehow, and uh, some error bound. We use the formula for alpha, which gives us this. Uh, and now we want to know if this is rational or not. Uh, I mean, we only have an approximation, so we can't determine uh, if it is rational or not, but we want to get an idea of, could it be that it's rational? Or does it seem to be irrational? To do that, we could compute the continued fraction expansion of this alpha. Uh, and as before, I mean, this uh, all of these digits are, are sort of the, the rigorous computed ones, and then we have more digits which we don't know what they are because it depends on the, the, the remainder here. So we don't know if it's rational or not, but what we can say is that if alpha is a rational number, then the denominator must be at least this big. And this is a sort of stark contrast to the case in the 2D case when the denominator was two. So this is sort of hints that maybe the alpha is irrational in the 3D case, uh, which I mean, it's not a proof that it is the case, but it gives a hint that was to try to prove in, in future work in the area. Uh, finally, I just want to say something about certifying the index of the eigenvalues. Uh, so with the method as I described, we can find enclosures of eigenvalues and this we can do fairly well. But we cannot say anything about the index of the eigenvalue. Uh, we don't know which one it is. And in our case, we need it to be the first one because this is the one we use in the formula. Uh, but what we did is we used uh, uh, a domain inclusion principle to find a lower bound for the second eigenvalue in our case. Uh, so what we did is that we extended the spherical triangle to a slightly larger domain. And on this larger domain, we could compute these eigenvalues exactly, or we compute them as series of functions. And then we know the index. And then we could see that, okay, the second eigenvalue of this larger domain is larger than our candidate for lambda one, which means that it must be the first eigenvalue. 
so in this case, we were able to use this simple domain inclusion to, to find the, uh, the index of the eigenvalue. Uh, and that was everything I was going to cover now. So thank you very much for, for listening. All right, fantastic, Joel. Well, we have a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. Yes. Well, may, may, this is more or less a remark. So this, what, what you uh, last said to, to um, get the correct index, this is of course, this is the principle of comparison problems. And um, um, that's, that's of course precisely uh, the basis of uh, my homotopy methods. That, that's just to, to explain to people the relations to, uh, to what I did, right? So that, that just as a little remark. And in our case, we were quite lucky because it was sort of enough that we could extend yeah. it to this domain and then it worked. But if it was yeah, not, then we would have used something. In fact, you need, only one, you need only one homotopy step. That's, that's, the, yeah. that's uh, yeah. what yes. I should say. Yes, that's true. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Can I have a question? Uh, yeah, please. OK, first, I want to confirm what kind of bit function are you using? to construct yes. the approximate, approximate angle function? Uh, so they're called the uh, spherical harmonics or Fourier functions. Uh, so it's, um, uh, they, are, uh, they are they are solutions to the Laplace equation on the sphere. But since we only care about part of the sphere, you can do some on the sphere, some of the coefficients have to be integers, or some of the parameters have to be integers. Uh, but since we only care about part of the sphere, they will have sort of fractional uh, uh, parameters. So it's the, the spherical harmonics is the, the key term to look for. Okay, so not the polynomial I see. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. so no so it, because they need to uh, exactly solve the, the PD. Uh, so they need to be solutions to the Laplace equations, which means that you're, you're quite restricted in your choice of, of basic functions. But in a sense, you are, you're, you're lucky that you can solve these, this equation exactly. So that's just particular for the spherical situation. So you cannot extend that to other eigenvalue problems so easily, right? No. So you need to have some sort of basis which solves the PD. That's true. So if, if uh, uh, you can choose a polynomial basis function, then it will be very convenient to con compute the maximum Maximum, yes, the L infinity error estimate, uh, but because there's some special property about poly polynomial. Okay, this is just uh, one comment. Uh, of course, now you are not using polynomial. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's um, uh, so we do some sli slightly smarter things than what I presented here because I mean, we compute Taylor expansions of high order and then we can do some smart things to get the maximum of these polynomials uh, of the Taylor expansion and then add error. Uh, so also, uh, if, okay, another comment. You see, this is the, for over the sphere domain. For yeah. binary domain, I think there are some results you may, uh, maybe you know. So there are people to give very uh, sharp, precise the bound for the Laplace angle value, maybe until the 100 digits to, to use this uh, Fox method. Yeah. So let me actually suggest that we. Um... Thank Joel again, 